Good evening and welcome. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. We hope that you're all doing well and safe at home. While our institution remains closed for COVID-19, we have been working diligently to find ways to engage our members from near and far. We have found that you're really enjoying these Zoom webinars with various authors and historical interpreters. We hope to continue to do these throughout 2020 and perhaps beyond. Again, we want you to know how much we appreciate your support, especially during these difficult times. The mission of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation is to support the educational and cultural programming at the ALPLM, foster Lincoln scholarship, and promote greater appreciation of history. We hope to do all of that tonight. Now on to tonight's discussion. Tonight we are joined by Richard Streiner. Rick is a writer and scholar who has written over a dozen books along with public affairs commentary. He served as a professor of history for over 30 years at Washington College before recently retiring. He now devotes himself full time to writing and lecturing. Rick is a specialist on Abraham Lincoln. He's here to talk to us tonight about his recently released book, Summoned to Glory, The Audacious Life of Abraham Lincoln. Like I said, it was just released a few weeks ago. We welcome your questions throughout the webinar. We'll try to get to as many as possible. So just type those in the Q&A box below. So please help me welcome Rick. Hello, Jamie. Hello, everyone. Hi, thanks for joining us tonight. We're really excited to talk to you about your new book. So we want to just kind of get started by just some general Lincoln information. So start us off. How do you see Lincoln in an overall scope of American history? And what were some of Lincoln's greatest accomplishments and contributions to America? Like many people, I regard Lincoln as our greatest president. Um, I agree with those who uh, view him as the great emancipator. Uh, but I go much farther than um, many people do in uh, the uh, assessment of his role in the anti-slavery movement. Millions of people, uh, including um, enslaved people, um, set the process in motion uh, for many years. The agitation to overturn the evil of slavery had been at work in American society. Um, and while some people, uh, for reasons that are often understandable, seem to be inclined to diminish uh, Lincoln's role, uh, as I say, it's understandable, you know, great white man who gave the slaves their freedom and so forth. Um, it was a partnership. It was a synergistic partnership. But without uh, a figure of Lincoln's strategic brilliance guiding events during the showdown, the anti-slavery movement in America might very well have failed. Lincoln forced his way to prominence during a great crisis, a great showdown, one of the great turning points in history, uh, more than any other participant in the free soil movement that sought to block the expansion of slavery, Lincoln warned vividly that slavery was about to spread into the free states. That was the message of his house divided speech in 1858. Uh, he, in effect, prevented that from happening. He prevented something larger. When his election triggered the secession movement, his leadership uh, during the Civil War prevented the creation of a new nation dedicated to slavery. It was absolutely uh, the protection of slavery that was behind the secession movement. There were many times during the Civil War when the Confederates came very, very close to winning. And if they had won, the whole history of the world would have been changed for the worse. You would have had a powerful slaveholding nation based upon master race theory right in the middle of the Western hemisphere, extending its power into the 20th century, the mind reels. Uh, that future was not allowed to happen because Abraham Lincoln was, was brilliant in guiding events using his innate strategic sense. A towering figure in world history for that reason. Absolutely, good point. Um, Rick, previous biographies of Mr. Lincoln really describe him as moderate, passive, or even conservative. 
But you dig a little deeper, a little deeper to show the workings of Lincoln's mind, stressing his cunning, his overall honesty, strategic thinking, even his ability to change his mind. What drove you to write this book? Well, for a long time, uh, as I studied Lincoln's uh, anti-slavery leadership, presidential leadership, military leadership, uh, one of the, the things about him that struck me most forcefully was his strategic brilliance. He was a man gifted with the sort of mind that could do simultaneous best case and worst case contingency planning almost all day. Uh, a remarkable uh, mental gift to have. Uh, and he used it with uh, exquisite skill. Um, and he would act with tremendous audacity so that uh, over and over again, when I encountered these notions of a slow moving, ponderous, passive, moderate, conservative Lincoln, this was totally at odds with, with the man whose life and work I was studying. And I finally decided, I'd written several books already um, discussing Lincoln's strategic brilliance, uh, but I decided finally to write a full-fledged life of Lincoln uh, for several reasons. Uh, biographies get people's attention for reasons that are absolutely understandable. Uh, so I decided to write my first biography. I wanted to uh, take aim at this very wrong-headed stereotype, uh, to aim a frontal assault against it. Um, but I also wanted to do it to gratify my own curiosity, because uh, as my opinions about Lincoln's leadership took form, I was very curious about the, the personal element. How, you know, in the course of his life, did he become that kind of person? Some of it flowed from his innate gifts, but some of it was circumstantial, and I wanted to learn and understand more about the way his life unfolded. So it was, a, you know, uh, my own curiosity that drove me to write the book as well. It was, it was a good read. I read it myself. So in the book, you refer to James Rutledge, the tavern keeper, as saying, there was more in Abe's head than wit and fun, that he was already a fine speaker, that all he lacked was culture to enable him to reach the high destiny that he knew was in store for him. I found that interesting. So early on, people could really see Lincoln's potential. Tell us about his early days and how he was developing to become who he ended up being. Well, he, as everybody knows, was born uh, in obscurity in backwoods, Kentucky, uh, son of a struggling farm couple. He uh, demonstrated intellectual precociousness at a very young age. His mother, Nancy Hanks, died tragically when he was quite young. Lincoln later called her, his, his birth mother, uh, a woman of genius. He said he believed he inherited uh, his mental abilities from her. But after uh, his mother passed away, his father, Thomas Lincoln, married again. And Lincoln's stepmother, Sarah Bush Johnston Lincoln, came to love Abraham as if he were her own son. And in reminiscences later, she went on and on about what a brilliant kid he was and how she could see this right away. Uh, and he was. He had a, a protean, many-sided personality. He was an extremely well-rounded individual. He had an earthy sense of humor uh, that could appeal to the rough and tumble crowd wherever he encountered it. But he also had uh, a very elevated uh, intellectuality uh, with, with penetrating curiosity behind it. And uh, added to these uh, more um, intellectual qualities and to these positive, life-affirming, uh, uh, emotional forces that drove him to seek uh, what James Rutledge called a high destiny, there was also Lincoln's melancholy. Uh, he uh, was a man who struggled uh, against depression episodically throughout his life. Uh, and the light and shadow of his intellectual, emotional development is a complicated and very, very interesting story. Uh, I 
shouldn't uh, talk for too long about this, but uh, as I'm sure you know, James Rutledge was the father of Anne Rutledge, Lincoln's legendary sweetheart. I say legendary because uh, for many, many years, the rumors that Lincoln was passionately in love with Anne and engaged to her were dismissed by historians as, as a baseless legend. In the 1990s, this climate of opinion uh, began to be reversed and it has turned 180 degrees. There is no doubt now among Lincoln scholars that Lincoln was ardently in love with Anne Rutledge and that her death nearly drove him insane. It plunged him into clinical depression, uh, the first in a series of such episodes. And uh, as he uh, struggled long before the age of mood meds, uh, to pull himself back from the depths, he developed certain innate mental strengths that would serve him well down the years. A very interesting and complicated story, his development. Yeah, I, I did find that interesting that um, there was more, the most recent discovery or research done about Anne Rutledge and Mr. Lincoln in 1993. You know, you think of it so many, many years ago, but 1993 is very recent. So um, that was a nice evolution of, you know, some more research done on that. So that was very interesting. Um, you mentioned he, he was an emotional man. Um, you mentioned in the book that Josh Speed later reflected that he, he had a lot of emotional shifts, but he certainly faced a lot of tragedy in his life, and that certainly had to be some of the reason why his emo he was emotional up and down. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. And the crisis of civil war and the appalling uh, cost of the war and loss of life weighed upon him every day uh, because he knew that it was his choice to resist secession, to resist a compromise on slavery to forestall secession that made this war inevitable. And uh, he sought solace in many different ways, but not least of all uh, in religion. He had been a skeptic, uh, an extreme skeptic in matters spiritual uh, when he was a young man. But during the Civil War, uh, he became uh, extremely, well, not exactly devout, but uh, extremely religious in a distinctly Old Testament sense. Uh, he saw uh, playing out in Latter-day America of a very ancient pattern, uh, chosen people given a chance to live up to high ideals, falling away, you know, into paths of declension tested by the Lord and made to atone. Um, it was all bound up in the, the horror of, of the war's cost. Absolutely. There is always a lot of research and discussion about Lincoln's religion. And you did talk about that quite a bit in the book, just as you can kind of see the evolution of, um, of his leadership, of religion, just as he experienced life along the way. I mean, he certainly would, like I said, been hardened by certain tragedies over over his time. So yeah, that, that's an interesting, um, it's always interesting to look into his religion and people are always curious about about his religion. Well, his second inaugural address is, is for all intents and purposes, a, a Jeremiah, you know, a, a sermon. Mm -hmm. He's explicitly religious. Yes, yes. Um, Speed also described Mr. Lincoln's analytical powers as marvelous. He could be writing an important document, be completely distracted by something completely non-related, and then go right back and pick up where he, he left off. How do you think this helped or hindered Mr. Lincoln throughout his life? Well, here was a man who was almost constantly, as we would say, at the top of his game <laughs> in terms of... Um, sizing up events uh, immediately, in most cases, relating uh, the parts of a problem uh, to the whole, seeing a big picture in a flash, but also seeing the subsidiary parts and the way they related to each other. It was the perfect sort of mind for a commander in chief to have. Uh, he was, as many historians have pointed out for a very long time, 
a natural strategist, a much greater strategist than most of his generals. Uh, it came to him through the same sort of instinct, the same sort of gift that enabled him to, to orchestrate power uh, across the board, not least of all uh, in the politics of race as they affected the politics of the anti-slavery movement. He was brilliant. Very good, but yeah, I mean, you can see that throughout his life and everything that he's doing. Um, early on, Lincoln gave what some might call a speech that helped him to rise to national statesmanship. In 1838, Lincoln addressed the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield. What do you think made this speech special and made him, made him stand apart from others at that time? It was a reflection on the uh, American experiment itself uh, and the prospects for success, which uh, in Lincoln's opinion, were becoming rather dim by 1838. Uh, he uh, saw the creation of a free society organized as a republic uh, as a supremely difficult challenge because of human na nature and the uh, <laughs> multitude of ways in which human nature can go very wrong. Uh, and Lincoln said things are already going very wrong. It was a warning. He saw things degenerating in some respects into mob rule. Uh, and then he said to get the chaos and disorder under control, we may very well verge in the opposite direction and to come to succumb to a Caesar-like, you know, figure who will straighten things out at the expense of free institutions. There was a, um, a stunning passage in this speech that a famous uh, literary critic, Edmund Wilson, noticed, uh, oh, in the mid 20th century, in the 1950s, in which Lincoln warned against a towering genius <laughs> who will, uh, through his brilliance and, and ambition, uh, reach uh, a, a consummation of power that will permit him to emancipate slaves or enslave free men. We must be on guard, <laughs> Lincoln said. And Wilson asked the uh, uh, obvious rhetorical question, was Lincoln, perhaps in unconscious ways, conjuring with his own future destiny? Uh, was he fearful that he himself might succumb to arrogance if he gave his own gifts full sway? A very interesting question, but this was uh, the nature of Lincoln's Lyceum speech in 1838, a remarkable speech for, for a uh, um, political leader th th that young. Absolutely, absolutely. It's very impressive. Um, there's so many questions coming in from the audience. I encourage everyone to just type them in the question and answer box. We'll get to as many as possible as we can. Um, so we're just going to continue on with some of our questions that we have. Um, let's discuss Lincoln as a lawyer. You describe his law practice as drawing heavily upon his gifts of as a strategist, an orator, and a humorist. He seems also very theatrical. So yeah. give us some examples of that. Well, he was often called the best trial lawyer. Uh, in the state of Illinois by his friends and friendly rivals within the legal profession. Uh, yes, he had a wonderful um, ability of uh, uh, working the emotions of a jury using humor, using anger, using indignation, using sadness, uh, whatever seemed to uh, suit the occasion. But these tactics, uh, these uh, different ventures in theatricality were all grounded in uh, an overall strategic plan to achieve victory for the client and defeat the opposition. And more often than not, Lincoln's tricky, deceptive nature would lull the other side, you know, into a false sense of self-assurance. They were being set up gulled, you know, into a trap which he would spring upon them when it was far too late for them to recover. Uh, he, he was the master of that. And of course, 
this was in many ways a uh, uh, proving ground for the, the kind of skills that he would use on the grand scale uh, to outmaneuver the Confederates, to outmaneuver, you know, racist uh, Northern Democrats, to outmaneuver uh, quarrelsome, envious rivals within his own cabinet, to outmaneuver everybody. Uh, it was extraordinary. Yeah, that, those were great examples in the book, just to kind of say, like, Mr. Lincoln just almost changed their own mind. You know, he, you could just see him with his mastery and being able to change people's mind and um, in, in a sly kind of way almost. So I, I like that. That's, I like that interpretation. Well, there was, there was one example that I found particularly funny. He was cross-examining a witness who identified himself as J. Parker Green, you remember that? And he asked him what the J stood for, and the answer was John. And so Lincoln said, well, why don't you identify yourself as John P. Green? That's your name, isn't it? Why don't you want to be known by your right name? <laughs> Is there some reason why you don't want to be known by your right name? Are you concealing something? Are there other things you're concealing? It was hilarious. Right. He's awesome. At least to me. Yeah, no, I love, I love the stories. It really makes it come alive for everybody. <laughs> um, I learned many new things when reading the book, but one thing of particular interest of mine was the Pekin Agreement. I didn't know about that. Um, so tell me how that came about, and do you feel like that might have halted Lincoln's growth or popularity in any way? Well, it was, a, um, it was an agreement um, that was not set forth in writing. Um, Lincoln claimed that uh, in a preliminary race for a seat in Congress involving several rivals within the Whig party who were uh, friends of his, particularly his very, very close friend, Edward Baker. And they both wanted the same seat in Congress. It was an awkward situation. And Lincoln worked out this, this deal for rotation in office. The idea was uh, this fellow gets the nomination, John J. Hardin. Uh, he got the Whig nomination, and his election to Congress was a foregone conclusion because the Whigs, you know, heavily outnumbered the Democrats in that district. And and the understanding was he will serve one term, uh, and after that, Edward Baker will will be next. And after that, guess who comes in third? Lincoln was was uh, setting things up to make his own election to Congress nearly inevitable. He would have to wait, but he was more than happy to do that because it, at least the way he, he foresaw the process unfolding, it would uh, make things assured. It would prevent you know, uh, nasty rivalries within his own party. It didn't quite work because at the last minute Harding reneged on the deal and Lincoln had to outmaneuver him. But that was the essence of the Pekin Agreement. Again, you know, strategy at work, uh, taking the long view over the horizon. Very clever. Very, yeah, I found that very interesting. Um, Let's talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Those are always very per of a particular interest around here, especially locally, because so many of these towns are so close to Springfield. Many of us live there or have been there. Um, you really start off by describing how Douglas arrived in private accommodations along with his wife, dressed very nicely. Lincoln often arrived in second-class accommodations, maybe from the train. Mary wasn't with him. But Lincoln really commanded power as a speaker. Um, yes, what was did. Lincoln's message along these stops? Well, the, the message was uh, all about slavery and race and the insidious way in which the Dred Scott decision uh, was uh, a key uh, step in a process, Lincoln said, that would, unless thwarted, uh, expand the institution of slavery into every single state. Uh, Douglas supported the Dred Scott decision in most of the essentials. Uh, the issue was slavery and the issue was race. Uh, Douglas was a virulent white supremacist. In fact, sorry to have to say this about the state of Illinois, but in the 1850s, Illinois was uh, an extremely uh, bigoted place uh, with 
regard to race. Many people saw it as the most racially prejudiced of the free states. Uh, and Douglas um, used racist appeals constantly. Uh, he, um, he was fighting for his political life because Lincoln was trying to throw him out of the Senate and take his place. Douglas wanted to be president. Uh, Douglas had to win this fight. So uh, Douglas was absolutely ruthless in exploiting the race issue uh, every time he could. And Douglas's message was essentially, uh, you are um, working the slavery issue, Mr. Lincoln, are you not? Because you are a Negro lover, are you not? Oh, you would love to see them free, but that's just the beginning for you, isn't it? You want to see them given equal rights? You want to see them marrying our daughters? Don't you? Yes or no? This sort of thing. And in the course of these debates, Lincoln had to prevent Douglas from changing the subject overwhelmingly from slavery to race. Lincoln had kept trying to bring the issue back to slavery as a gross affront uh, to human rights. He had to, as best he could, make the case for the full humanity of African Americans without coming across as a Negro lover because there was a very big risk that that might happen and then he would be just jeered right off the stage. Uh, this is very uh, incendiary material. It was then, it is now. Many African Americans uh, for a long time have been trying to, to ascertain where Lincoln really stood on the issue of race and how they ought to feel about him. An angry black journalist named Lerone Bennett Jr. wrote this book, Forced into Glory, several decades ago, which he argued Lincoln was uh, an opportunistic, ambitious politician who was a racist. He said a number of things that reveal his, his bigotry quite clearly. Um, uh, my book, Summoned <laughs> to Glory, uh, an answer to that, uh, as opposed to other points of view that I regard as either mistaken or simplistic. Uh, yes, Lincoln did say some things in the course of the Lincoln-Douglas debates that do sound rather bigoted. Um, and while I can't prove it, I can't prove it absolutely, my feeling is, shocking though it might seem to those who still believe in a simple, honest aim, that he was faking it, uh, that, that he was saying things that he didn't fully believe or didn't really believe at all. He was being deceptive, as he was quite capable of being. His performance as a trial lawyer showed that. His performance as president would show it again and again. And if you contrast the things that he said under brutal pressure from Douglas in 1858 to the things that he began to do as president when he had the power, especially behind the scenes in secret, opening up the way for black voting rights as early as 1864, uh, no, it doesn't make sense to me that Lincoln had a gut level prejudice against African Americans. I can't prove uh, what his innermost feelings were uh, it's just that uh, this interpretation is the only one that makes sense to me, given the overall totality of what he did. Sure, certainly. He would always try and bring it back to the founding principles of what America was really based on, the Declaration of Independence. And so I like how you pointed that out. Um, that was really trying to be his message throughout. So that's good. We have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to start to get to some of those. Um, how well did Lincoln and Grant work together in ending the war and in Grant's decision made at the Appomattox Courthouse? Well, Grant was the general uh, whom Lincoln had been seeking since the outset of the war. Uh, Lincoln needed a commander with uh, as good a strategic mind as his own. He needed a commander capable of uh, fighting total war. Uh, he needed a commander who was capable of seeing the armies of the enemy, uh, not just as obstacles, but as targets as well, as sources of power that had to be uh, forced uh, to uh, surrender or forced out of existence. He needed a general tough-minded enough and relentless enough to fight that kind of total war. He'd been seeking such a general 
And finally, um, by 1864, uh, he decided Grant was that man. Uh, Grant um, had a reputation that had uh, um, moved up and down over uh, the first few years of the war, particularly after the Battle of Shiloh, where Grant had been caught by surprise. Uh, the battle was very nearly a defeat. And the rumors began to circulate that, that Grant was saved by uh, uh, timely reinforcements, that Grant had been drunk, that Grant was, you know, an alcoholic, this sort of thing. So, so Grant had to um, uh, recover from that. He, he had to uh, rebuild his reputation. And that, that took time. Uh, finally, by the end of the war, um, Grant was the head of a team, encompassing several other extremely gifted generals, William Tecumseh Sherman, Philip Sheridan, George Thomas, Lincoln's you know, dream team of total war commanders uh, who would fight the enemy to the end, to the death. Uh, and Grant at that point was general in chief, coordinating it all. Um, one thing I have to observe though, ironically, in the pivotal election of 1864, such a dangerous election for Lincoln, for America, and for the world, because Lincoln was almost replaced by a white supremacist Democrat. Poor Grant was, was tied down in a stalemate at Petersburg. The great turning point of 1864, and the great turning point of the entire war, was the victory of William Tecumseh Sherman in the capture of Atlanta, you know, it's very interesting uh, that many people see the Battle of Gettysburg as somehow the turning point of the war. I see Atlanta as, as the turning point. I like that. I like that. Another question is coming from James. Isn't it true that emancipation would have failed if the Union lost the war and didn't call and didn't his call for support by the armies make freedom real? Well, uh, that's absolutely right. Yes, of course. Uh, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, um, Democrats immediately called it unconstitutional. Lincoln tried to uh, get Congress to uh, adopt a package of constitutional amendments to make that issue moot by making it constitutional. Oh, yes, uh, without military victory, the Emancipation Proclamation would have gone down the tubes in August 1864 when it looked like Lincoln would lose and be replaced by a white supremacist Democrat. Um, Ling called the abolitionist Frederick Douglass to a secret meeting at the White House and said, uh, what I want you to do is, is organize bands of African-American scouts who will get behind enemy lines and spread the news of emancipation uh, to plantations uh, the, where the slaves might have been kept in the dark about it, uh, encourage them to run away if they possibly can and cross our lines so I can free them while I still have the power. Because I won't, <laughs> shortly. Right. Oh yes, if, if Lincoln had lost, uh, I have no doubt that his opponent, General George McClellan, <laughs> failed Union general, white supremacist Democrat, uh, would have abrogated the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, perhaps tried to send not only all the liberated slaves, but those who had fought in the Union armies right back into bondage. Who knows? A nightmare future that, that never unfolded, thanks to William Tecumseh Sherman's victory at Atlanta. Thank goodness. Um, Bill from the audience is asking, what are your thoughts about Lincoln in the Bardo? Does that accurately reflect Lincoln as a father? Well, I have not read Lincoln in the Bardo. It's a very interesting work that one of my students called to my attention several years ago, and I should read it, and I will read it, but I have to sincerely plead ignorance. I haven't read it. That's okay. What do you think about him as a father? I think he was um, a fun, uh, a generous father in many ways, and you know, some people thought, oh, we let his boys do whatever, but I think he would have been a fun father. What about, what do you think? Oh, he certainly was a fun father. There's, there's just no doubt about it. Um, and he was inclined to um, be lenient, um, inclined to, to just encourage his sons to um, be happy and spontaneous. 
because his relationship with his own father had been so grim. Uh, his father, Thomas, uh, tried to thwart Lincoln's uh, development of his own intellect. Uh, Lincoln resented his father. The resentment was mutual, a very, very sad uh, situation. And so uh, when Lincoln himself became a father, uh, not surprisingly, he was inclined to do exactly the reverse, you know, to, to make up uh, for it, to prove, you know, to himself, to his kids, to God, to the world, what a good father ought to be. Um, another question that's come in from Jenny that's interesting. Lincoln did many things right. Can you offer an example of a big mistake that he might have made? And more importantly, how he responded to that mistake or perhaps even learned from it? Well, let me see. Yes, of course he made mistakes. Um, some of the mistakes were they need to be understood in context. For example, he appointed certain military commanders who proved to be disastrous. Uh, those were certainly mistakes. Uh, he could see it himself in hindsight. The problem is that given the information he had at the time, the mistaken decisions were uh, understandable. Uh, one of the uh, comparisons I tried to make in the book was the comparison between Lincoln and Jefferson Davis as commanders in chief with regard to their um, commanders in the field. They both had the same experience. They had to assess the competency of generals based on battlefield results. Uh, they had to look at the track record of generals. Were they successful or unsuccessful? The problem was that the results of battles could be very misleading. Uh, a general could win a battle through sheer good luck or through the ineptitude of the other side. Uh, or a good general could lose a battle through sheer bad luck or through the bungling of subordinates. Oh yes, Lincoln made a number of clearly mistaken decisions when it came to uh, those he put in positions of, of high command. There's just no doubt about it. In terms of uh, deeper mistakes, um, really deeply mistaken decisions, I must confess I'm so uh, struck by, by the many superb decisions Lincoln made. I haven't really perhaps... Um, yeah, that's okay. That's a good answer. I mean, that's a hard question when so many people honor and look up to him in so many ways. So that's a good one. Um, well, nobody, nobody's perfect. Uh, nobody uh, can uh, get it all right. And if I were to ask myself that question in particular, put that front and center and go back over Lincoln's life asking that question steadily, that's very interesting. You know, uh, some new insights uh, might emerge. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I don't want to foreclose it with, with uh, you know, uh, a hasty answer. It's a good question. Absolutely. And I think you, you described in the book several times just how he evolved. Um, he evolved on the idea of slavery and running for office and leadership. I mean, of course, you know, he learned along the way. So you could definitely see that, you know, um, his, his evolution of his leadership throughout the, throughout the book and throughout Let me life. talk so. about uh, some other kinds of arguable mistakes. Uh, the thought just struck me. If you turn to his love life, all right, if you turn uh, to um, his in romantic involvement with women. After the loss of Anne Rutledge, uh, his law partner, William Herndon, expressed the belief that after the loss of Anne, Lincoln was really incapable of loving any other woman, loving any other woman fully. Uh, and I think that may be true because the suicidal depression that followed might have made Lincoln fundamentally and perhaps unconsciously afraid to fall deeply in love again, lest another loss like that might drive him all the way into incurable madness, who knows? But uh, after the loss of Anne, 
uh, he got into this really strange and ill-advised courtship with a woman named Mary Owens. Well, that was certainly a mistake. Uh, he made a, a hasty pledge to marry this lady who was the sister of an acquaintance in the town of New Salem. He hadn't thought it through very well. All right, there's a clear mistake. He said so himself. He regretted it bitterly and, and had a great deal of trouble extricating himself from this relationship because he had a guilty conscience over you know, hurting her feelings. And it's entirely possible that something similar was involved in his courtship of and marriage to Mary Todd. I mean, that was a stormy marriage, a very controversial relationship to this day. Lincoln scholars uh, have often uh, taken sides in regard to Mary Lincoln. You know, there, there are some Lincoln scholars who regard her, uh, you know, it, it becomes a blame game as, as to who uh, between the spouses uh, was more responsible for the problems in their marriage. Uh, would it be possible to argue that Lincoln made a bad decision in, in marrying Mary or staying married to her? Well, that's a tough one, you know, uh, emotional that's, situation. That's actually a question that's kind of come in with that. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a good segue. Do you think Lincoln would rise to the height of presidency if he did not marry Mary Todd Lincoln? That, that's that's a, a wonderful unanswerable question. Uh, and, and I asked it myself in the book, if, if Ann Rutledge uh, had lived, uh, if Lincoln had had a happy marriage uh, to his first sweetheart, uh, would he perhaps have just been another lawyer, you know, in Illinois? And that would have been that. He would have had a happy home life that satisfied him. Um, the uh, uh, the emotional impetus that, that drove him outward, you know, outside of the home, seeking other kinds of fulfillment compensation. Could it be argued for frustrations on the home front? Uh, no doubt, to some extent. Uh, yes, uh, a very, very interesting question indeed. Unanswerable, but uh, powerfully suggested. So many of them are, that's for sure. Um, another question that's come in from the audience, and, and this is always a good discussion. Um, what is your opinion on Lincoln's relationship with the members of his cabinet and how those relationships affected his actions during his presidency? Yes. Well, uh, of course, Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, wrote that famous book, Team of Rivals, on that very subject. Uh, Lincoln building a cabinet, including some of his fiercest rivals for the Republican presidential nomination in 1860, um, William Seward, Salmon Chase in particular. Uh, by 1864, Salmon Chase was, was openly intriguing to get Lincoln dumped from the ticket and take his place. Um, yes, it was a very calculated decision, a very double-sided decision. Uh, these were um, gifted, powerful men, men of influence, men of resourcefulness. Uh, Lincoln did not want a cabinet of weak sycophants. He wanted to take advantage of all the power sources that he could bring into alignment on his team. Uh, but he knew what a double-sided proposition it was because these people could be very dangerous, very treacherous. Uh, I think he came to the conclusion that it would be better to have these people on the inside where he could keep them on shorter leashes than to have them outside the administration where they would be more difficult to control. Uh, but, uh, oh yes, it, 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 by, uh, um, by degrees, uh, throughout his presidency, reaching a climax in 1864, well, in 1861, it was a problem with William Seward, who was openly treacherous, openly trying to undermine Lincoln's uh, policies with regard to uh, secession, uh, with regard to Fort Sumter, with regard to a lot of things. Oh, yes, Lincoln had his hands full, and he knew it. And he was ready to outmaneuver these people, and he did. Yeah, he, yeah, did. he did it masterfully, that's for sure. Oh, he certainly did. Um. Describe how campaigning in 1860 compares to campaigning in 2020. Today, oh, today we think of campaigning state to state and it and includes extreme amounts of money to succeed. But what would it have looked like back then? Well, 
there are all kinds of comparisons between the presidential election of 1860 and the ongoing presidential election, all kinds of comparisons between Abraham Lincoln's America and Donald Trump's America, yes. Uh, not very happy comparisons. Um, to take the more specific of your questions, money. Well, money was a factor and um, one of William Seward's um, um, most uh, important tactics in his quest for the Republican nomination in 1860 was to brag about what a formidable war chest he had amassed, uh, and indeed he had. Um, but the other side of that proposition for Seward was that um, the Republicans who distrusted him, and there was good reason for distrusting him, worried that all this emphasis on money uh, might prove to have sordid and unsavory complications, especially given Seward's relationship to the wealthy and influential Thurlow Weed uh, political boss in, in New York State. And in fact, the nickname Honest Abe uh, was, it, it, it wasn't coined in 1860, but it was put to very effective use in 1860 by Lincoln's supporters uh, to contrast him to Seward. Uh, because one of the um, indisputable things about Lincoln is that there was never a whisper of financial impropriety associated with him ever. Whereas several of his rivals for Republican nomination, Seward, Simon Cameron from Pennsylvania had evil reputations, you know, for unsavory financial dealings. So yes, the issue of money was, was important then as it is now. Um, many big differences, but, but not not the least of the similarities, sorry to say, is that in 1860, an America profoundly divided against itself. Um, certainly things are not at all the same now. Of course they're not. The, the differences are immense, but the haunting relationship between the divided America of 1860 and the horribly divided divided America of 2020. Yes, you know, it is food for thought. And, and some of the deeper problems of Lincoln's America are with us still, very much so, especially the, the racial unrest. Absolutely, absolutely. As, as aggravated by the inflammatory figure we have in the White House right now the comparison between the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party of Donald Trump. Can one even call it the same party? I don't think so. I don't think so. In many ways, the party is the reverse now of what it was then. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a question that's come in from Francisco Lopez. How well did Lincoln get along with his vice president, Andrew Johnson? And how do you think Lincoln would feel about Johnson's policy towards the South and the freed slaves? Well, that's, that's a, a powerful question with a very unhappy answer. Um, Lincoln's vice president throughout his first term was Hannibal Hamlin from Maine, a staunch anti-slavery Republican. Because of the military political situation uh, in June 1864, the Republican convention made the fateful decision to dump Hamlin as Lincoln's running mate because the Republicans were running very, very scared uh, and for good reason. Uh, the terrible casualties, the battlefield stalemate, the combined with you know, elements of a white supremacist backlash, they were running very scared. Uh, and so they made the decision to uh, reach out to patriotic unionists of both parties they even, uh, for, for that one year, dropped the name Republican from their party and adopted the, the name of the National Union Party. They brought uh, a war Democrat, Andrew Johnson, onto the ticket. It was not Lincoln's idea. It was not Lincoln's idea, which leads me to a belated answer to an earlier question. I think Lincoln should have had a more hands-on policy toward the selection of the ticket in 1864, but he was running scared too. 
His party was deeply divided. Radical Republicans were trying to get him dumped. A terrible situation. Uh, Lincoln had gotten an, uh, along well enough with Andrew Johnson uh, when Johnson was a unionist uh, member of the U.S. Senate. Uh, uh, the the only member of the Senate from a slave state that had fallen under the control of secessionists who, who kept his seat in the United States Senate. Lincoln made Andrew Johnson war governor of occupied Tennessee. Um, so far, so good. But then, uh, after everything changed, you know, with, with the, the uh, um, salvation of Sherman's victory in Atlanta, with Lincoln's landslide reelection, with another four year term ahead of him, with Republicans controlling both houses of Congress by super majorities, Lincoln was clearly working in synergy with the radical Republicans in the springtime of 1864 to lead, to usher in reconstruction policies that would have involved land redistribution, uh, that would have involved black voting rights, uh, Andrew Johnson was not at all on the same page with Lincoln, quite the contrary. Uh, and in particular, at Lincoln's uh, second inauguration, when Andrew Johnson was sworn in as vice president, he was clearly drunk. And he created this, this horrible, embarrassing scene. Uh, and when the scene moved from, from the interior of the Capitol building, where the vice presidential swearing in took place to the east front of the Capitol outdoors where, where uh, Lincoln's swearing in an inaugural address uh, work to happen. Lincoln whispered to several people, make sure that Johnson is restrained and doesn't say anything. And then there's this, this incident when Lincoln was visiting Grant's army at the front in Petersburg and Andrew Johnson and a friend came down to call upon him Lincoln reportedly said, I refuse to see either one of them. Get them out of my sight. I don't care how you do it. I don't want them in my presence. Oh, God, you know, uh, no, Lincoln, I'm sure, was turning in his grave, you know, uh, poor man, after what would have been his second term, was uh, finished out by this white supremacist Democrat. Uh, one of the great, great tragedies of American history. Absolutely. Um, Nathan from the audience is asking, at the height in the Civil War, why wasn't Lincoln better protected at Ford's Theater? And if Grant expected the invitation to be at Ford's Theater, wouldn't Grant's soldiers protected him as well as Lincoln? Uh, a haunting question. Uh, the... Um, the feelings behind the question are absolutely justified. Lincoln was not adequately protected. He should have been adequately protected. Uh, it's, it's one of the enduring tragedies of Lincoln. Uh, and here's another belated answer to that earlier question about Lincoln's mistakes. Lincoln was far too cavalier about his personal safety. It's very hard to say why. Lincoln had a premonition of assassination. Uh, he received hate mail right after the 1860 election, threatening his life. Uh, he had an eerie, uh, superstitious uh, experience in which he beheld a double likeness of himself in a mirror, uh, which he took to mean that uh, he would serve one term but not complete the second. There was an assassination plot uh, in the midst of his journey from Springfield to Washington, and that once he took effective action <laughs> to uh, keep himself safe uh, with the help of the detective Alan Pinkerton. Um, but when he arrived in Washington, um, he immediately began to argue that, that uh, the public should have open access to him within the White House, that guards were unnecessary. Uh, very, very strange, very foolish. And as, as, uh, as events progressed, that attitude became worse and worse. He became more and more fatalistic, uh, almost flippant with regard to his personal safety. 
uh, there was an attempt on his life, an apparent attempt on his life in August 1864, when he was riding from the White House to the soldier's home, uh, which was this summer residence, and a shot rang out in the dark and, and uh, uh, knocked his hat onto the road with a bullet hole in it. Um, he should have been better protected at Ford's Theater. It's, it was a horrible situation. Uh, and he himself was very much to blame for it. I, I think, and I can't prove this either, that with his um, deepening spirituality, with his uh, sense of very real responsibility for all the hundreds and thousands of deaths, hmm? uh, he was haunted by that. Uh, it did not deflect him one instant from his purpose, but he felt keenly uh, that he was responsible. And there was a great sense of solace for him in the belief that this was all a providential drama, you know, that God was acting out. Um, and I think given the fundamentality of the golden rule in Lincoln's ethics in, in his statecraft and his whole position on slavery, uh, never do unto others what we would never want done to ourselves. Uh, that was the, the deepest obscenity in, in enslavement, you know, reducing others to a status that, that we would fight tooth and nail to prevent if anyone tried to force us into the status of livestock. I think that as Lincoln reflected on all the deaths, the battlefield deaths, there was this incident in 1864 where Lincoln rode out to the site of a battle and actually climbed up upon the parapet and exposed himself to Confederate fire. I think maybe, and I'm not the first one to, to have supposed this, a historian named Gabor Borit uh, floated this idea 20 years ago. He said, maybe Lincoln was trying unconsciously to prove to God that he was willing, if God so willed it, to make the same sacrifice that his own decisions had forced upon so many hundreds of thousands of others, and that if he too must lay down his life, so be it, so be it, let the will of God prevail. Maybe that was what accounted for it. I don't know. It's a theory that can never be proven. Yeah, it's an interesting theory. And like you said, a lot of these things are, we just don't know for sure. So we'll have one last question before we kind of wrap it up for the night. And it's again, just a hypothetical question, obviously. If Abraham Lincoln was alive today, what would you want to ask him? If he were alive today, I would ask him to do something in the election of 2022 give this nation back its soul. That's what I would ask him to do. <laughs> Challenge Donald Trump within the Republican Party, uh, throw his support to Joe Biden, run as a third party candidate. I'm sorry to be so openly political, but uh, uh, well, I've taken the fateful step and there's, there's <laughs> no turning back. Yes, that's what I would ask him. I would ask him to do something, anything, to put this nation back upon the right course. That's what I would ask him. Well, he would certainly have the leadership to do so. So yes, again, again, Rick, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was my pleasure reading the book. Um, we want to thank all of our members for tuning in tonight. We hope that you enjoyed the program. I know as much as I did. We encourage everyone to go out and purchase the book from your local bookstore or from roman.com with using your 30% discount code they've provided to us. It's in your email or it's on our Facebook group. So we encourage you to purchase the book if you've not done so already. Um, when you close out the webinar tonight, there'll be a short survey that'll pop up. It'll just take you a minute or less. So letting us know how to improve our services for you guys. As well, um, please consider making a monetary donation of any size um, on our website, www.aoplm.org. This helps us to ensure that these programs can continue in the future. We do want to thank our gracious sponsor tonight, Union Pacific Railroad, for helping us make this event possible and many more in the future. Our next webinar, we will be joined by Pam Brown, who will be impersonating Mary Todd Lincoln, and that's going to be July 15th, as well as we have a couple other authors coming up. So much more, so please stay tuned. 
again, Rick, we want to thank you so much for joining us. It was, it was a pleasure to get to know you a little bit more and to read your book. So again, we thank you. Jamie, thank you. And if I may, I'd like to say one more thing to the listeners. Please. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer so many of your questions. If any of you would like to contact me, uh, email contact information is available on my website, www.richardstriner.com. Uh, just go there, it'll give you an email link, and I'd be happy to correspond with any of you. It's been a great pleasure for me to be with you all tonight. Thank you so much, Rick. We can also include your email in the response email that we send out to everybody that registered tonight, again, with the link on how to purchase the book. But yeah, we can definitely include your contact information. So again, it was certainly our pleasure and our honor to have you. And we look forward to having you in Springfield sometime. I would love to come. And Jamie, thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thanks again. Good night.